I'd like to say hello and to welcome you to this class. I want to start by saying that this is a very informal class that we're doing tonight. What I decided to do is because there was a request for some sort of help in dealing with a lot of the fear and anxiety that's currently being experienced by those who live in Israel and also by some people who live outside of Israel who have family and loved ones who live in Israel and they're very concerned for them. And uh, there's a couple of techniques, some things that I have been teaching for several years now that I have found especially helpful in dealing with um, fear. I don't know that it will produce a tremendously effective results for severe anxiety. So uh, I just wanted to preface this with um, there are some things that we're going to talk about tonight. Again, you know, I don't really have, I have a few slides just to make it a little more interesting, but I don't, didn't prepare an actual presentation. I'm just sharing with you some pieces from the coaching that I do and from the things that I teach that I hope will be helpful to you. And uh, my understanding is, is that there are going to be quite a few people who are going to be watching this by recording because the timing wasn't quite right for them. So if you're watching this by recording, I want to thank you very much for watching it. And I just like to ask you to keep in mind, again, like I said, this is meant to be a um, kind of informal, almost a coaching session, even though I'm the one who's going to be doing pretty much all of the talking towards the end. I will um, ask for questions, we'll unmute people and uh, see if anybody, if there's any discussion that needs to be had. But otherwise, I'm going to share with you and just understand that it's nothing, this is nothing formal. This is just my way of trying to offer something to people. It helped me and I'm hoping that it will tremendously help you. So... What I'm going to teach you tonight, there'll be a few topics that we're going to cover, but they all basically surround this idea uh, of the technique that I call broadcasting, okay? Now, we all have voices in our head, okay? They start when we're very young. Now, that doesn't mean we're schizophrenic. It means that what happens is, is that we have a brain and we talk to ourselves and we send ourselves messages based on our life experience, all right? So, for example, when we're young, we start out with a sense of, well, first of all, we're not aware of ourselves when we're first born, okay? We very quickly become aware of others, such as our mother and our father and then other people in the world you know, and, and for a while, most everybody other than our mom and dad are everybody else. They're others. But then as time goes on, we become aware of them as well, right? You have the teacher. You have the doctor. You have um, whoever else you have in your life. These others become somebodies in your life, okay? So you become aware slowly, little by little, of the fact that there are others in the world. At some point, somewhere around three years old or so, you begin to become aware of who you are, or of your existence, rather. You become self-aware, okay? So now there's mom, and there's dad, and there's teacher, and there's doctor, and there's these other people, but who am I? right? I now have a concept of I, of me, and I understand who these other people are and the roles that they play in my life, but I don't know who I am. And so we begin a lifelong journey of trying to figure out who we are, okay? Now, how do you do that? Like, how do you create an identity? So what happens is, is that we travel through life trying to find out, we're basically asking the question, unspoken question, who am I, okay? So, I don't know if you had children, maybe when you were a child, you read this book. There's a book called, Are You My Mother? You know, my kids love that book, right? So you have this baby bird that falls out of the nest and the baby bird is walking and the baby bird comes upon another animal and says, are you my mother? And the animal says, no, I'm not your mother. I am a cat. I am a whatever, 
Okay. And that's the whole book. Are you my mother? No, I'm not your mother. I'm a whatever. So we go through our life just like that little baby bird, except instead of asking, are you my mother? We ask, we're asking other people, can you tell me who I am? Who am I? See, we go throughout our life knocking on people's doors saying, who am I? Tell me who I am. I need to know who I am. And so we go through life and we have these experiences. And like, so, you know, we're riding a bicycle and we fall down and we get hurt. And either somebody tells us or maybe they don't tell us at all. We just simply grasp the concept of I'm a klutz. So we take that and we go cut and paste on me. This is who I am. I'm a klutz. Right? So we go to school and maybe we're rejected by a group of people. And so what have they told us about who we are? You don't fit in. So we may translate that as weird or a loser or, you know, whatever. Okay? Loser. So now I've got klutz. I've got loser. And I'm getting all of these labels, most of which are given to me by other people because I don't know who I am. I'm aware of myself, but I don't know who I am. So we go on this search. And then that identity that we start to form creates voices in our heads. These voices are us. They're not like, you know, some external thing, but they're our voices, right? And so I drop a plate in the kitchen and what's the first thing I think? Oh, you're so stupid. Or, ugh, oh, you're such a klutz. Well, where did that come from? Clearly, it's because I have gotten the message before that I'm a klutz and I have cut and pasted that onto my identity. And now that voice that goes along with that piece of my identity reminds me that this is who I am. So we all have these voices in our heads, which are really simply an expression of who we are. Okay, they're simply an expression of who we see ourselves as part of our personality. All right, we talk about multiple personality disorder, but the truth is, is that we're all made up of a, a multifaceted personality. There are different aspects to us, and we're very complex creatures. So we've created these voices in our head that remind us of who we are. Okay, now going back just a little bit, as we talked about being a young child, becoming self aware, and creating our own identity, right? So, going back a little bit, we go back to the creation of man. It's very, very important for us to understand that the Bible, the Torah, says that man was created in the image of God, right? Now, we tend to think that we know a lot about human beings and not very much about God. Because let's face it, God is this omniscient, omnipotent, eternal, omnipresent, divine being that's incorporeal. He doesn't have a physical body. How could we possibly know who he is? And to some degree, that's true. However, in Judaism, of course, we believe that the Bible was given by God to us, okay? And it says that man was made in the image of God, all right? So this document is meant to teach us about who God is. And it tells us a lot of things about God. It tells us the attributes of God. It tells us many things about him. And one of the things it also tells us is why we were created and that we were created in the image of God. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, think about what is an image, all right? A picture is an image, right? It's a direct reflection of the original, right? You guys are seeing a picture of me on the screen. You're also seeing a picture of two men on the screen, right? You're seeing a picture of me. It's an image. And for the most part, it is me. I mean, it is not me but it looks exactly like me. So when the Bible says, the Torah says, that we were created in the image of God, what that tells us is that anything that the Torah tells us about God 
we can get a clue from that that we also are like that because an image is an exact reflection of the original. There are a few differences. For example, um, the video that you're seeing of me speaking to you is an exact representation of me, except that it's not three-dimensional. Now, you can have a sculpture, which is three-dimensional, but it doesn't move. It's not alive, okay? So we are an image of God. We're a reflection of Him, and we can learn about who we are, but we do have to keep in mind that um, that certain aspects of our divinity are limited just as certain aspects of the dimensionality of an image is limited, okay? Even if you had a hologram, it still wouldn't be the real person, but it would be a very good representation of who they are, okay? So the Bible tells us that we're created in the image of God, so that should give us a clue about who we are. And what's the first thing that the Bible, that the Torah tells us about God? He created the world, right? We just did this Parsha just this week. Hashem spoke and he created the world, all right? So we can learn from this that we as human beings are also creative. And because God, how did he create? He created through his speech, right? Therefore, we can know that we create reality through our speech. Now, this is a very foundational, fundamental concept. Besides the concept that we just touched on about the voices in our heads, which is important to what I'm going to teach you tonight, the idea that we create reality through our speech is also a fundamental principle that this concept is based on. Okay? Now, it's interesting because the commentators in the Talmud refer to human beings unlike all of the rest of the animals in the world, as midabrim, as speakers, right? And they say that that's what, that's what distinguishes between us and the other, the other animals, the animals. We're not animals because we're speakers. We reason and we speak. And no other animal in the world speaks. And um, the interesting thing is, is I'm not into gematria so much, but I find it fascinating that they point out that the word midabrim, the gematria for the word midabrim, and the gematria for tselem elokim, which means image of God, there's different ways of doing gematria, and one of the ways of doing gematria, where you add all the letters together, they're the same, okay? Now, do with that information what you will, but the sages have equated being midabrim, speakers, with being tselem elokim, made in the image of God. And if we're made in the image of God, then we, and we know that God created through his speech, then we must also know that we create through our speech, okay? That is a fundamental principle that you must understand, is through your speech, you create reality, all right? And what is thinking? What are your thoughts? Your thoughts are speaking internally, okay? You speak externally through your mouth, and you create external realities. You speak internally through your thoughts, and you create internal realities, okay? Now, that is a very, very important concept because you have to understand that your moods influence your thoughts and your thoughts influence how you feel okay very important to understand your moods influence your thoughts and your thoughts influence your feelings and it's very important also to distinguish between moods and feelings a lot of times we use those two phrases uh, those two terms interchangeably and we need to understand that they're not actually interchangeable because they're different your feelings can be controlled. In theory, if you can control your thoughts, which we're going to work on today, if you can control your thoughts, and you can only to some degree, but then you can control your feelings. Your moods are something different. Your moods are kind of like a sine wave, okay? Everything in this world is in motion. We live in an ocean of motion, 
right? Everything is in motion. In fact, if I were to pick up an inanimate object, like my glasses, for example, all right? They're an inanimate object. They're not alive, right? But they are in motion. If we were to take a very, very strong microscope and put them under this very, very strong microscope and get down to the molecular level, we would see that there is motion going on inside these glasses, right? You have the atoms, you have the neutrons and protons. Remember your biology, chemistry, chemistry class, right? You have protons, protons and electrons and neutrons, and some of them are moving around others, and obviously I'm not a scientist, but the point is, is that everything in this world is moving, all right? You are moving. And we're going to come back to this in a few minutes because you function on a uh, vibrational pattern. Everything in this world is moving. It's in waves. Light is in waves. Sound is in waves. You have energy that you put into the world, and it's also in waves, okay? Now, I just want to remind, since we had someone new join us, I just want to remind you that this, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the class, that this is not a formally designed class. This is uh, several things that I do in my coaching and, and in my teaching, and I just kind of put it together to try to be helpful in this situation that we're in. So if it's not uh, quite as polished as you might expect, just bear with me because it was kind of spontaneously put together. But anyway, all right. So we talked about the, um, the idea that we are once we become self-aware that we're looking for clues as to who we are and we're asking people, we're going around the world asking people, who am I, who am I, who am I? And we're pasting an identity on ourselves. And we create voices. The voices do not mean that there's something wrong with us psychologi psychologically, but that the voices are the product of our personality and who we think that we are. Okay. Now we've talked, we're talking about thoughts, moods, and feelings. So you function on a vibrational pattern, and so does your body, okay? And you have this vibrational pattern of moods. You have up moods and you have down moods. You have lower moods and you have higher moods. You have good moods and bad moods, okay? And they influence what happens when you think, okay? Thoughts come into your mind all the time. Your brain produces something like 50,000, 50 million I don't know, lots of thoughts every day, okay? They, they bombard you. They're bombarding your brain all day, all night, as you sleep, when you're awake, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of thoughts. Now, you cannot control all of the thoughts that pop into your mind, but you can control what you do with them. But what affects those thoughts is your mood, also events that happen, right? You cannot have a feeling without first having a thought. For example, if I tell you to be angry, you can't just become angry. I have to do something that gives you a thought that makes you feel anger and you become angry, all right? So just a word about moods because you need to understand that how well you can manage your thoughts and feelings is relying on, is dependent on your moods, all right? Now, moods are a biochemical reality, and there's nothing you can really do about it, but not completely, all right? Your moods, the highs and the lows depend on biology, depend on genes, what's in your family history, okay? how frequent they go, all right, how frequent you have highs and how frequent you have lows. It's all chemical. It's all biological and it's all chemical and there's very little you can do about it. But there are some things that you can do to change the chemistry. If you change the chemistry, then that will also affect the thoughts, okay? And it will affect whether or not you are in a position to do anything positive with those thoughts. So what are some ways that we can adjust our moods? Well, we can do it through chemicals, right? Um, whether you're talking about coffee, chocolate, smoking, 
uh, antidepressants, alcohol, all of those will affect our moods. All right, now most of them are temporary. Also, on the, in the positive direction, another way that you can alter your mood is through exercise. Anything that you can do that's going to send certain natural chemicals into your bloodstream, like for example, when you exercise, you have um, endorphins and um, adrenalines and, and different things that are going to rush through your body, and those are going to affect how you feel. Okay, they're going to affect your mood, which will affect your thoughts, will affect how you feel. All right. But getting back to this concept of your thoughts influence your feelings. If we can learn to get a handle on those thoughts, then we can, to some degree, control how we feel. All right. So the thing you have to learn to be aware of is to tell whether you are in an, a high mood. Or a low mood because if you are in a high mood then you're in a high resource state and you are able to rightly judge the thoughts that are coming through your mind but if you are in a low mood you are in a low resource state and you're not equipped to determine whether or not the thoughts that are coming into your mind are of high quality or low quality, and most likely what kind of thoughts are you going to experience? You're going to experience low thoughts, right? And if you experience low thoughts, guess how you're going to feel? Okay, so it's a good, we can't do it in this class because the scope of this class just isn't going to cover it, but it's important for us to be aware of what kind of a mood we're in when trying to deal with how we're thinking and feeling. Okay, so one of the ways that I can figure out how I am, whether I'm in a high mood or a low mood is by looking at my day and seeing like, I know that I can be a very critical person. So if I'm really super critical, then I know that I'm probably in a low part of that mood cycle. Okay. Women also have the biological influence of that on it. And when you are in a low place mood wise, it is a good idea not to try to problem solve. I mean, obviously you have to do some problem solving in, in life as far as working and stuff, but like not working on yourself, okay? Save it for a day when you're in a higher resource state. All right, so just to reiterate one more time, your moods inf uh, inform your thoughts and your thoughts affect your feelings. Get control over your thoughts, and to some degree, you can control how you feel. This is a really important um, concept in order to be able to deal with fear, because obviously that's a feeling, and also to be able to put into practice what we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes, which is this idea of broadcasting. Now, you, like I said, function on a vibrational pattern. As you walk through the world, you are putting waves, just like a boat that goes through the ocean, you are making waves in the world, okay? You're broadcasting, which we'll talk about in just a minute, on a certain frequency. In fact, you are like a two-way radio, all right? Now, have you ever noticed that sometimes you can walk into a room full of strangers and the people that you come in contact with will automatically respond to you in a way that most people respond to you, whatever that may be, as if they know you, but they don't know you. They've never met you before. Now, for some people, that means that complete strangers emotionally abuse you or verbally abuse you. In my case, I walk into a room and people automatically think I'm in charge, and it's kind of really quite fascinating actually, but it wasn't always that way. It used to be that people would consistently emotionally abuse me, okay? Consistently. I would go into a class and people would assume I was trying to get attention. I would do something. Anyway, how is it? Why is it? Because you are like a radio and you are broadcasting on a certain frequency. 
And just like a two-way radio, if you, I don't know if you're familiar with them because, you know, don't have many of them around nowadays, but you know how the radio on your car or the radio on your, um, I guess, on your phone or whatever uh, has a frequency, has frequencies. You turn it to 100 FM or 1600 AM, right? Because you have, there's two different ways that you can measure these frequencies. And so there are channels that go on both, right? And when you turn a radio to a particular frequency, you're going to receive the signals that are floating through the air on that frequency, right? So you turn your radio to 99 FM, and whoever is broadcasting on 99 FM, you're going to receive. But you also are broadcasting on 99 FM. All right, we're all walking around, we're all little radios, broadcasting radios, two-way radios. We're all sending out signals, we're all sending out messages into the world, and the world is responding on the frequency that we're sending out. So, for example, if I am a victim and I see myself as a victim, guess what frequency I am broadcasting into the world? I'm walking around the world sending a secret message, a quiet message that nobody can hear but everybody can perceive, saying I am a victim. That's what's broadcasting out of me. Now, just like a two-way radio, you can only receive on the frequency that you are broadcasting on, right? If you have a two-way radio, a two-way radio, if it's set to 99, you can broadcast on 99 and you can receive on 99 but you can't broadcast on 110 and receive on 99, and you can't broadcast on 99 and receive on 110. So what happens is, have you ever heard the phrase, you know, do I have a sign on my back that says, kick me, abuse me? I, when I first came back to Judaism, I thought I had a sign on my back that said, correct me. Well, in a way, I did. Why? Because I was very not confident about what I knew about Judaism. And everybody picked up on it, even if I didn't say a word. The fact that I was not confident, people picked up on it, and they felt free to tell me what to do and to correct me, even when they were wrong, even when I really did know better than them, because I was broadcasting on this frequency that I didn't know anything, or didn't know anything about Judaism, or I was a newbie to Judaism, or whatever phrase that you want to use, okay? So the same thing, unfortunately, happens with uh, for example, a woman who's been sexually abused or raped. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but being in the therapy field, in the coaching field, this is something that I have noticed over and over and over again, that you have women who have never been abused and have never been raped and have never been attacked, and then you have women who have suffered many, many, many different types of abuse or attacks, and it just it happened more than once in their life, right? Right. So you hear this person's story and you're like, wow, this is so sad. This person was abused as a child and then she was raped in college and then she married an abusive husband, okay? And just over and over and over again, she's been attacked. Why? Because she's wearing a sign basically because she's broadcasting on this frequency of I am a victim, abuse me. Now, don't... Don't get upset with me until you hear me out, okay? Because I'm not blaming the victim. All right? It may sound like it, but I'm not. Because the person who's broadcasting on this frequency doesn't even know they're broadcasting. And they certainly don't know that that's the frequency they're broadcasting on. And don't you think that if somebody told them, and that's why I'm here to tell you, that they were broadcasting on a frequency, if they could figure out how to change the frequency that they would, of course they would. And that's why I do this course, because we often are broadcasting on a frequency and we don't even understand why we're getting back the things that we are, but you can only receive on the same frequency that you're sending out. So we're broadcasting, I'm, an abuse, I'm, I'm um, a victim, and boy, doesn't this have larger ramifications for the state of Israel. Do you think the state of Israel is broadcasting as a whole, we're victims? Hello? Yes. But um, what happens is, is that at some point, someone came along, the first person who traumatized that woman, and they kicked her 
radio to broadcast abuse me or I'm a victim, right? She doesn't even know she's broadcasting anything. She certainly didn't choose the frequency, but her abuser did. And until she learns how to change that frequency, that's what she's going to broadcast on. And so that's what we're going to talk about today because learning how to broadcast changes the reality that you experience and can create a situation for you, a state of mind where you can have the confidence to know that you are safe, for example. Now, let me give you a, um, just a, a little disclaimer and an explanation. When I give this talk and I give the techniques over, it's very easy for somebody to say, well, where's God in all of this? Well, like I said, God created us in his image and he gave us this gift of being able to think and speak and create reality. That's what I'm talking about here, okay? This is a gift from God. Disconnect it from God and what do you have? Have any of you ever seen the movie The Secret? All right, they take these principles which come straight from the Torah, but they divorce it from the Torah and what do you have? You have magic, basically. It's just like the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is a very special part of Judaism. But if you take it and you divorce it from the Torah, guess what you have? You have a cult. You have magic. You have something that's forbidden, where once it was not only not forbidden, but it, it, it was a special teaching, a special gift that was reserved for those who have earned it, basically. Okay? So don't divorce the concept from the source. The source is God, and you have been given this gift of being able to create reality, and there's all sorts of studies that show that what you think about, you get more of. There was a study done uh, on college basketball players who were bound for professional, okay? And what they did with this group of basketball players was they took the group and they first they tested them and assessed their skills and somehow they assigned some sort of um, uh, rating system so that they knew how they had scored, what their skill levels were, okay? Then they took this basketball team and they divided them into three groups, right? The first group was told to practice several hours a day every day for the period of this experiment, okay? Maybe it was two weeks. The second group was told, don't do anything. Okay? No practicing for two weeks. Nothing. Just sit around and eat french fries, whatever. The third group was made to sit in a chair or whatever and watch videos of themselves and other teams playing basketball for the same amount of time as the group that had that was practicing okay so if the group that was practicing was practicing let's say six hours a day the other the third group was watching videos of people playing basketball for those same six hours a day after the two weeks or whatever period of time it was they brought them all back and they reassessed their skills no surprise the group that practiced many hours a day in, increased their skills they got better no surprise the group that didn't do anything actually got a little worse, okay? Because their skills weren't uh, being exercised. They weren't up to date. But the big surprise was the third group, the group that was just watching videos for six hours a day, they actually improved their skill level 80%, 80% by sitting and watching videos, 80% of what the group that was actually practicing for six hours a day did. And what they learned through this experiment was that your brain does not know the difference, not significantly so, between what you do and what you think about. Okay, now obviously there's a certain, that accounts for the extra 20%, there's a certain amount of actual physical muscle exercise, right? Because if you're not exercising, you're going to lose some of it. But if that being taken into account, the brain did not know the difference between physical practice and virtual practice. 
That's very, very significant. Your brain is very powerful, and what you think about and what you concentrate on, you get more of. So we can use this principle of broadcasting, the fact that we broadcast into this world, and the fact that we create reality, and the fact that what we concentrate on, what we focus on, we get more of, and we can use it to alter or create the reality that we desire in our life, okay? Now, there's a couple of things that you also need to know. First of all, okay, so, but it still sounds like magic. No, this is the other side of the coin of prayer. See, prayer is asking God for something, right? And this does not negate the need to pray. We still need to pray. We still need to ask God. We still need to go back to the source, of, back to the one who's in control of everything, right? But in order for God to give you something, you have to have something to hold in. Like if, if my child comes up to me and says to me that they want, let's say, some M&Ms, okay? They want some candies. All right. Well, I've got this bag of candies in my hand. So I say to the child, well, give me your hand. And the child holds their hand out like this. Okay. I can't put the candies in their hand. Their hand is closed. Right. In order for me to give them the candy, they either need to bring a vessel with them, a cup, or they need to create a vessel through their hands. Okay. So we ask God to give us blessings, but we come to him like this with our hands closed. How can he give us the blessings? Broadcasting creates the vessel for us to receive the blessing that God wants to give us. So we pray, and God says, okay, I'm going to answer your prayer. Now we need to do something to make it reality. In order to make it happen, we have to create a vessel for it. And that's what broadcasting is doing. Now, like I said, we all broadcast whether we try to or not, but you can actually change the frequency that you are broadcasting on, all right? You can actually change the frequency that you're broadcasting on. How? How do we create reality? We create reality through our thoughts and through our speech. So, when I want to bring something into fruition, I pray and I ask God for it. And then I believe that it's going to happen. And I send it out either verbally or mentally thinking it. Have you ever noticed that, like, for example, let's play, say you're playing a game with somebody. And you say, okay, I don't want a seven. I don't want to roll a seven. I don't want to roll a seven. You roll the dice. Guess what comes up? A seven, right? It happens more often than not, doesn't it? More than statistically it should, right? Because sometimes we broadcast so strongly that we can bring something about. Now, let me give you one other, um, not disclaimer, uh, but one other caveat just to explain this before we get into the final part of it. And that is that there are three reasons why, even if you put this into practice, you may not see some changes, okay? And the three reasons are that, first of all, you might be asking for something with bad intention, okay? So if you're asking for something with a bad intention, God may put a veto to it. He may say, no, this is not okay. The second reason it may happen is that it's not, or may not happen, is that it's not good for you. Because remember, there's, God, there's a God factor in the situation, right? So sometimes we try to create reality and God says, no, I don't think that this is the best thing for you. I, can, I see where it's going to lead and so I'm putting my foot down. Because the truth is, is that while this works most of the time, it does not work all the time. But the third reason is the biggest reason why it sometimes doesn't work. And that is that broadcasting is sending out a signal, right? But if you've been following what I teach, you know that fear interferes with the signal. Fear creates static, okay? The best analogy here to broadcasting. Fear creates static. And so let's say I want to create the vessel 
to receive money, okay? But my relationship with money is not healthy. And I have a tremendous amount of fear when it comes to money. So I'm trying to manifest a blessing of money and I'm putting it out there. I've prayed, Hashem, please give me, let's say $10,000. I need $10,000 in order to do A, B, and C. Help me figure out how to make the $10,000. And then I'm going to create the vessel. $10,000 is coming to me. This is where you see all those affirmations and other things, you know. Um, sometimes the best way to, I, I am so grateful, God, that you are giving me this $10,000. And, you know, imagine that you already have it and you put it out there that $10,000 is coming to me, $10,000 is coming to me, but you're so afraid that if the $10,000 comes, you won't know what to do with it. You won't be able to, um, you still won't have enough or um, I'm trying to think what other kinds of fears could be associated with receiving the money. Um, it's not going to happen. So that's also, that's a conflict that creates status, static. Um, so it's very important for us to take those feelings, sorry, those thoughts, and not click on them. You know how sometimes you get in the emails, you know, an advertisement, right? Now you can get rid of the advertisement. You have no control over the fact that that advertisement came in. But you can either click on the advertisement, you can X out of the advertisement, you know, you can get rid of it completely, or you can leave it in your inbox but ignore it. And it's the same thing with thoughts that come into your head. When a thought comes into your head, you can either click on it, go there, as they say, you know, are you going to go there? You can click on it. You can get rid of it or you can ignore it. But what you focus on, you get more of. So if you get a thought that something bad might happen to you, okay, you can either ignore it, you can get rid of it by replacing it with another thought, or you can click on the link, which is what most, many of us do, especially those who consistently experience a tremendous amount of anxiety. Now, in the amount of time that we have left tonight, I cannot walk you each through personally getting rid of those thoughts. But I will tell you that if you change what you're focusing on, you can usually get rid of the thought. Now, oftentimes it's temporary. But for example, when I deal with coaching clients that are experiencing depression, I will frequently, and I know it sounds cheesy, trite, whatever, but I will frequently tell them to go watch a humorous movie, a comedy, something that they really enjoy. Because at least for that hour or two, they have changed what they're focusing on. And so their thoughts change. And at least for that hour or two, their feelings will change accordingly. Okay? Now, if you're sitting there watching a funny movie, but you're still thinking about the fact that your house is about to be mortgaged out from under you, well, then obviously what you're doing is you're clicking on that link. What you have to do is ignore that one and click on the link of the funny movie or the beautiful child or the beautiful sunset or the beautiful music or go fry yourself up some onions and, and potatoes or have a piece of chocolate. You know, chocolate is great because it uh, changes your thoughts and it changes your mood. <laughs> so, you know, chocolate is the drug of choice, right? But um, so... I'm going to tell you a story, a couple of stories, and then I'm just going to share one final thought on the idea of broadcasting, and uh, then I'm going to open it up to questions. I'll have people turn on their mics so that uh, I can answer any questions, because I'm sure that there are things that I should have said that I didn't think of saying, and that might be very relevant to you, okay? So my daughter, shortly after we made Aliyah, my daughter got engaged, and uh, I had a friend who had promised, sorry about the hair there, um, I had a friend who had promised to loan me the money for her wedding. Now, at the time, we had no credit, we had no income uh, to speak of, and we knew that the bank would not give us a loan for the wedding. But we needed $10,000 for the wedding, okay? 
where am I going to get $10,000 from? A friend of mine says she's going to loan us the money. And about a month before the wedding, she says to me, um, something happened with my investment. I don't have nearly as much money as I thought I did, and I cannot loan you the money. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do now? It's a month before the wedding. I need to come up with $10,000, which is a lot of money. Where am I going to come up with $10,000? So I decided to employ this process, and I began broadcasting. I prayed, obviously, and I started just putting it out there. $10,000 is going to come. I don't know from where, but Hashem, I am grateful to you that the money is coming and that our needs are being met, that this $10,000 is going to come my way. And I just thought about $10,000 showing up. And I put it out there that $10,000 was coming to me. So we're about two and a half weeks before the wedding, and I still don't know where this money is coming from, really. I was very, very nervous, but I decided I wasn't going to click on those links, and I was going to continue to broadcast. So my son, my youngest son's high school, was having a family weekend retreat for Shabbat, a Shabbaton, and we were there, and they asked me to speak, and I did. And there was somebody else there, a rabbi, who also spoke. And I started to get this feeling like I should just mention something to him. So I went up to him afterwards and I said, Rabbi, I don't know you and I don't know how you might be able to help me, but I'm going to share with you something that I need help with. And if you have any ideas, please let me know. So I was not even asking him for the money. I was still asking God for the money. But I figured I would share my need with him and if, see if he had any ideas. I mean, I didn't know of any loan societies that would loan that kind of money. I mean, I know that there are some, but I didn't know anything about them. But who knows? Maybe he had connections, whatever. So anyway, so um, he says, okay, well, tell me. I said, well, my daughter is getting married in two and a half weeks. And he stops me and he says, how much do you need? I said, $10,000, 40,000 shekels. He says, okay, after Shabbat, I'm going to give you my card. Sunday, give me a call. So I said, okay. So, Motzei Shabbat, he gives me his business card, and uh, we go home. Sunday, I call him up. I say, hi, you know, this is Panina Taylor from the Shabbaton. He says, uh, right, 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 right. Um, you needed 40,000 shekels, right? Yeah, I need 40,000 shekels. Okay, can you meet me at Gan Soccer at 2 o'clock tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, I can do that. I mean, sounds a little sketchy, doesn't it? But I had my daughter with me because we were running errands for the wedding. So 2 o'clock, Monday, we get to Gan Soccer. He calls me. He says, okay, I'll be there in a minute. He pulls up in a car. He hands me an envelope, and he drives off. What do you think was inside the envelope? $10,000. Well, actually, it was 40,000 shekels. But it was an envelope stuffed full of 40,000 shekels. Okay? I have another story, which was really quite incredible. I had a client, who, a student, who was in a, an abusive situation. She was uh, in a mostly emotional abuse, um, you know, but emotional, mental abuse by her husband, okay? And she came to me, and we worked through this process, and we worked through uh, what was going on, and we talked about broadcasting and how she might be broadcasting on this frequency of abuse me, all right? So I said, now, what I want you to do is I want you to walk around just putting out there this idea of peace and calm and strength. I am strong. I am strong. I am full of peace. I am, I don't know what other words we chose, but we chose messages that were to her the antithesis of abuse. Okay. So that evening she comes home and her husband starts to get all upset with her. And he, you could see it building on his face. And she's broadcasting these, these other ideas of peace and calm. And he just throws his arms up in the air and walks off. 
because she was broadcasting on a different frequency than what he was used to her broadcasting on. And see, what happens is, is that we broadcast on a certain plane of existence. We, we broadcast on a certain vibrational frequency, okay? And other people will either broadcast back, they'll either come back to us on that frequency, right? They'll, they'll respond to us on that frequency or like kind of being in two different planes of existence. There's just like no interaction at all because we're broadcasting on two completely different frames of, uh, of frequencies. So in this case, she's now broadcasting on a different frequency and he's coming at her on this frequency. And guess what? There was no conflict. They were like on two different planes of reality. If you've ever watched any science fiction, like Star Trek was great for this, you know, you'd have the, the people of Star Trek and then you have these other people who exist in a different plane of existence, but like they're faster or slower or something. And so they're basically existing in the same place in the same time, sort of. And then, you know, like they get clues that there's other people there or whatever. But the point is, is that this is a very powerful tool and it's a gift that you've been given by God, having been created in the image of God who created the world through his words. You create reality through your words, your external words and your internal words. So here's the thing. If you want to change the frequency that you're broadcasting on, all you have to do is think about it. Take control of your thoughts and speak it out if you can. Okay, sometimes you can't, right? If I'm standing at the bank and I want them to approve my loan, right? So I'm going to send out, yes, say yes, say yes. Well, I'm not going to say it out loud because I look like a total idiot, right? But I still send it out in my thoughts. Say yes, say yes, all right? So, um, but here's the thing. You have to choose positive language. Why? Because there's no such thing as a negative frequency, right? Think about it. You can't tune a radio to negative 80 megahertz or whatever, negative 80. No such thing. Frequencies are only on the positive. So what happens is when you put a sentence out into the world with a negative, like, I don't want to be fat anymore, okay? What you're broadcasting is not don't want to be fat. It's fat because there's no such thing as don't want to be. That's a negative sign. And there is no negative in broadcasting. Okay. So instead, you need to choose words that are positive. I want to be thin and healthy. I want to be thin and healthy. I'm going to broadcast that I want to be thin and healthy. And I have news for you. It works. Sometimes you also have to put in a little effort, but I just lost 35 pounds in four months. Okay. It works. I'm telling you, it works. Um, so, for example, when I am flying on a plane or driving down the street, right, because where I live, between here and basically civilization, is a very dangerous area. There's, in fact, my husband, he was on the bus coming home this evening and his bus was pelted with rocks, okay? Well, if that had been a car, that would have been a problem. So, when I'm going down the road, I'm asking God to protect me, right? I don't want any incidences, okay? But I don't say don't want, all right? I only put out, I only broadcast positive. Get me to my destination safely, in peace, in wholeness, as it ought to be, okay? Positive words. So that's one of the first things you need to do. You need to put it out there in thought and in speech, and you need to do it in the positive, okay? Now, I'm telling you that you can create reality that you can then step into and live in, which is another, you know, that, that is the greater part of this course, is this idea of creating the reality that you want, the preferred story that you want in your life. When you put it out there, you can step into it and you can wear it like a bubble and people will actually perceive that from you. So for example, when I wanted to be a speaker and a teacher, I started broadcasting that I am a speaker and a teacher. And then I created this invisible virtual reality of being a speaker and a teacher. And then I stepped into it. And guess what? People assumed I was a speaker and teacher before I was even speaking and teaching. 
You can affect your reality by what you put out there, okay? So take control of your thoughts. Don't click on the negative ones. Replace them with something positive, even if you have to do it by distracting yourself. Put out there in thoughts and in words only positive of what you want to happen, what your preferred story is. Get away from the fear of it because that can create static that's going to interrupt the broadcast that you're sending out there. Change the messages that you are broadcasting to the rest of the world by changing how you see yourself and put it out there and step into it. And um, only do it in the positive. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on my glasses because I can't see my computer. All right. And I'm going to, can I unmute people or do you have to unmute yourselves? Let's see. Because there's no option to have you guys raise your hands. So let's see. Uh, manage participants. Okay, I'm going to unmute everybody, but please just one at a time. If you have any questions, please go ahead and say who you are. You know, hi, this is Leah. This is Panina. Um, I have a question. And then um, I'll be more than happy to try to answer your questions, okay? Okay, everybody is unmuted. Does anybody have any questions? No questions? No questions, but, uh, you know, if we're talking, um, there was an article that I saw recently on H.com that described very similar to what you were describing. Huh. Uh, yeah, about, a, like, uh, they gave an example of a woman who was looking for a shidduch, and the, and the rabbi said to her, well, you know, you need to make room for the shidduch in your guys. I shared you that to... story recently in a class I taught. Oh, you saw it? Okay, so you know which one I'm talking about. Yeah, then. yeah, I think I may have even yeah. shared that. Yeah. In... Anyway, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. To make so, best, to make space, right. The, the rabbi said to the woman, you know, where do you sleep on your bed? She right. said, uh -huh. you know, I sleep in the middle. He says, start <laughs> sleeping on the side. Make room for the person that you want to be next to you. And he mm -hmm. did it with the car in the garage, and he did it with yeah. the, right the clothes mm -hmm. in the closet, and he ended up finding the her soulmate actually very quickly once she did that. So it really does. You need to create the vessel to receive the blessing, right? And also, and also because once she started thinking in that direction, it's exactly what you're saying. She was really broadcasting mm -hmm. uh, the idea that she's available, right. and otherwise she's sort of like subconsciously broadcasting and she's not available right right absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. okay uh just give another opportunity to hila and mordechai if either of you have anything that you want to ask or share and otherwise we're going to go ahead and close the uh, talk for the evening All right, so one, just one last thing, and this is my advice, especially if you're in Israel and you're going to be going to Jerusalem. You know, when you get in the car and you're going to pray for God's protection, broadcast that, you know, I, I've even been known to say I am invisible to anybody that would want to harm me. I'm invisible. They're not going to see me. Um, again, is it 100% guaranteed to work? You know, there are other factors at play. But, um, but I do believe that it does. I mean, there's scientific evidence that doing this does help change the reality that we experience. And I think that when you're doing it, when you're talking about somebody with anxiety and fear, you know, be cautious, but don't be full of fear because you can use this to, I mean, there's a story, Rabbi Glazer, Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer, who is a teacher at Aish, he tells a story about how once he was walking to Jerusalem in the evening, and he, hang on a second, I thought I muted everybody, let's see, mute, 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 okay, 
because I'm getting feedback. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So Rabbi Glazer tells a story about how one evening he and his wife were walking through Jerusalem and he came across, they came across a group of skinheads, as he described it, who were drunk and they were violent and they were starting to get into a fight. And one of the skinheads noticed him and his wife. And of course he told her, you know, stay back, let me talk to them. And he walked up to them and the guy was like, you know, all tough and he was like ready to hit him. And Rabbi Glazer just started broadcasting, you know, love, love. I love you, man. And he said to the guy, he said, you know what? You don't need to do this. I love you, man. And because he was broadcasting love instead of fear, which imagine the amount of strength that takes, but you can do it. You can do it. You can broadcast love, peace. You can broadcast peace and they're going to receive peace from you. Okay. So he says to the guy, you know, Hey, I love you, man. And the guy's like, Rrr. and he says, yeah, give me a hug. And so the guy comes up to him and hugs him. And his wife is like, what just happened? Unbelievable. You can change the way other people respond to you and react to you by what you put out. You ever notice that the dog or the cat always annoys the person who's most afraid of them because they can sense the fear? Well, human beings can sense fear as well. And so one of the greatest things that you can do to protect yourself when you're walking down the street or standing at the bus stop is broadcast peace broadcast calm, broadcast safety, put it out there, create the vessel for that to be what is your reality. And I guarantee that you will begin to calm down as well. Okay. So I have everybody muted at the moment. I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself, but I'm going to assume that there are no more questions. If there is just put in the chat really quick, I have a question and I'll unmute you. And uh, otherwise what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you that I want to thank you for being here with me. If any of you want ongoing coaching, I am available for coaching. You can contact me by emailing me, panina at paninataylor.com. You can go to paninataylor.com and there's a variety of ways of contacting me through there. I'm available for coaching in person in the Jerusalem area and I'm available for coaching via Skype or Zoom, which is what we're using here um, to uh, do coaching that way. And uh, anyway, so I just want to thank you so much for joining me. May we all have good news soon. May we all experience only peace, only good, and may all of Israel experience only peace and blessing in our lives. And uh, I just want to wish you guys a good week, a Chodesh Tov. It's currently uh, Rosh Chodesh, Cheshvan. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys again in future classes. Okay, so thank you so much for joining me. Take care and I'll talk to you soon.